Well, welcome, everybody. I'm Mitchell Kaplan. I want to welcome all of you to Books and Books tonight uh, for this very, very special event. Uh, for those of you who are watching uh, through the power of the internet, uh, we do a lot of these events, as you know, and you can find out about what's happening uh, just by going and clicking on our live stream uh, banner. Uh, or if you'd like, you can also sign up for our email list by going to booksandbooks.com, and we will send you more emails than you can possibly imagine um, to know about all the different events that we have going on here at the bookshop. But tonight is an event that I'm personally really excited about, and there's a, all, all kinds of uh, exciting surprises tonight. Um, I first encountered this book, I guess, back in uh, January, it seemed like, when I, when I got the galley of uh, Natchez Burning, and uh, took it home on the plane. We were in Seattle and read a lot of it on the plane into the next day and into the day after to that. You guys are in for a real treat if you have not read this book yet. Um, that's just the first treat that you're in for tonight. The second one is that our guest, Greg Isles, will be in a conversation with someone we all love and who really needs no introduction here in Miami. And that's Dave Barry is here with us tonight as well to engage Greg in, con in conversation. Uh, Dave is the author of the most recent book is You Can Date Boys When You're 40. Um, <laughs> And he has recently uh, written a book called Lunatics, uh, Dave Barry, along with a third surprise and treat, and that's Alan Zweibel, who's here with him as well, uh, right over here. So we've got a great, great evening. I think I even saw another wonderful Miami local writer, uh, Paul Levine, who's here somewhere, too, all the way in the back. So it's going to be a fun-filled evening. And without further ado, let me bring on Dave Barry. Give him a really big round of applause. Uh, thank you, Mitchell. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a real honor for me. Um, and it's such an honor that I actually, this, I never do this. I have notes. <laughs> I'm not a notes guy, but um, I don't want to. I don't want to mess this up because this is. I, I'm excited about this. I'm excited about this book. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Greg, then I bring him up. Um, First, his bio stuff. He was born in Stuttgart, Germany. His dad is a physician, was the and he ran the medical uh, facility at the uh, U.S. Embassy in Stuttgart. Uh, he grew up in Natchez, Natchez, Mississippi. He's a Southern boy. He's very Southern, the most Southern person I know. He graduated from what? Roy Blunt is pretty Southern too. Yeah, that's true. We get have a Southern off at some at some point. Uh, he graduated from the University of Mississippi and. Uh, the part I want to spend a little time talking about before I bring him up, he, he, after he got out of the University of Mississippi, he, he played in a, a band, Southern band, and it's the, my favorite band name of all time, and it's perfect Southern band. They were called Frankly Scarlet. Um, <laughs> but I did not know that when I met him. And the way I met him is I play in a rock band called the Rock Bottom Remainers, which consists of authors. Stephen King's in the band, Mitch Album. Ridley Pearson, Scott Turow, Kathy Goldmark, um, Roy Blunt Jr., um, Amy Tan, a lot, of, a lot of authors, very good authors, not very good musicians for the most part. <laughs> Andy Borowitz sometimes performs with us, um, if you want to call it. Um, <laughs> but at some point, Ridley knew Greg and said, you know, told me about this guy, Greg Isles wants to play with the band, you know, play, play. and I said, well, what does he play? And, and really goes, well, he says he's a bass player. Um, so, OK, well, you know, could, I don't remember the circumstances exactly. But you know, that's not too threatening, a bass player. Anybody could play bass. Anybody in this audience could get up and play the bass and be fine. Because um, it's bass. You can't really hear it most of the time. And so Greg came. And I don't remember even where or when. Probably down here. Played the bass. Hey, I mean, he's good. He seemed like a good guy. Whatever, let him in the band. Our, our philosophy is if you're not that good, you can be in the band. <laughs> a lot of people say, I'm really good at whatever. We go, well, you're not going to be in our band. You know what I mean? <laughs> so then I, later on, I find out about this, frankly, Scarlet business. And it turns out Greg Isles is the best musician in the Rock Bottom Remainers. Greg Isles could be a professional musician. He's an incredibly talented musician. He can, he can sing really well. 
He can play guitar really well, and he wrote a song. Well, he, he rewrote a song. He wrote a song called The Big Best Seller Blues, which is a parody of a parody. It's a parody of the James Taylor song, um, Steamroller, about being a bestseller. And it's the best song the remainders do because because Greg performs it. But anyway, all that leads up to the fact that the guy is very, very talented. But what he's really talented at is writing, um, which kind of pisses me off that he's so good at, <laughs> so good at music and so good at writing. Um, but his first album, I mean his first album. <laughs> he wrote his first novel in 1993, Spandau Phoenix. It became a New York Times bestseller. Every single book he has ever written since then has become a New York Times bestseller. The book he's going to talk about tonight, Natchez Burning, which is a fantastic book, is, is, a, is, a, is going to be debuting this Sunday, is it, as number two on the New York Times bestseller. That's really hard to do. Really, really hard to do. It's because he's really, really good. So without any more of me blowing smoke up his ass, <laughs> Please, please welcome my friend, Band-Aid, and a great author, Greg Isles. Dude. Okay, I'm going to start by putting you on the spot. I saw you speak at the Miami Book Fair. This is maybe seven, eight years ago. Can't remember. Yeah. And you said at the time, and this has always been true of you, that you're not a genre writer. You don't, you know... The thing about the book publishing industry is when you write a book that succeeds, what they want you to do is write that book again, yeah. Yeah. and again, and again, and again. And we all know authors, and I'm not knocking it because they make a lot of money, but that's what a lot of authors do. They write the same book or the same basic book over and over again, and it works, and they make a lot of money doing that. And you made a big point of how you don't do that, and you don't. You have not done that. Here you've written the first of a trilogy which sounds kind of like a genre yeah. thing going on. What's that about? Well, you should know better than that, Dave. Um, pardon me, I'm losing my voice, but I'm going to try hard. <clears throat> uh, the Quiet Game is where I introduced Pen Cage, my quote series character. But I waited seven years to write the second one and seven years to write the third one. Um, and then when I was finishing what would be the next Pen Cage, what I thought would be the most important book I'd ever write, because it had to do with my family, and race and civil rights in the 60s. I tried to write it as one book. And I was about two weeks from deadline. And uh, like Douglas Adams said, I love deadlines. I especially love that whooshing sound they make when they go flying by. <laughs> That's me. I was on about my third extension. <clears throat> and I pulled out on Highway 61, and a, and a truck hit my driver's door going 70 miles an hour. And I mean, I, I took my leg off tore my aorta, broke 20-something bones, like Steve, our bandmate, uh, being hit by the van. And so what happened was, when I was in that accident, I just I stopped caring about what the publisher wanted or what anybody else wanted. I'd always been rebellious and gone from this genre to that genre. But this time, I just said, to hell with it. I, I don't care what happens, you know? And so what I did was, I expanded it to three books, each of them approximately this long, so in five years, I've written about 850,000 words. That's about eight and a half conventional thrillers. So when people think you're sitting at home sipping mint juleps and writing three, four pages a day, that's, that's not it. So this is not a series novel. It's one novel. It's just 2,000-something pages long, and they make you split it. So. I have not written that many words in my entire life. <laughs> You've said that many, though. No, it's true. But I, can I tell my Douglas Adams yes, anecdote? I know yes. this is about him, but I do because Douglas Adams and you both famous for not making deadline. Well, he makes his deadline, but he makes it. Tell him how you make your deadline, because it's kind of I find this as a writer fascinating. Like like how I process. how you wait till there's two yeah. weeks to go. Yeah. Okay. One of my be best books I ever written, one of the best I've ever written, is probably Black Cross. Okay, which was set in the Holocaust, Germany in '44. What I do is. Uh, you know, Stephen King says in every writer's mind, e even his, there's a basement and there's a bunch of boxes in there in complete disorder. And that's your subconscious. And the worst thing you can do as a writer is to go down in that basement and try to start putting those boxes in order. Because guess what? There's a crew that's already down there doing that for you. <laughs> your job is to stay the hell out of the way. <laughs> And that, that is what I do. I go through most of the year kicking back, coaching my kid's team, soccer dad, whatever. And then one day it's like I'm a pregnant woman and my water breaks. Pow! 
I go, I sit down in my lazy boy. I have a hospital table with monitors and I have a refrigerator with tab and like Twinkies and all that. Tab! And I, <laughs> you want to write a bestseller, buy a case of tab, okay? So I sit down in that chair and a good day for me is 30 pages. I mean, I just start going. Black Cross was written in about 10 weeks and it's 170,000 words long. God knows how many words that is a day. And I almost didn't go back and change a word. So I'm kind of a freak, you know. I have to have that pressure. Where do you get the tab? Because <laughs> well, I we're need something. It's carcinogenic. Well, I shouldn't say this. We're being live streamed. Some people say it's carcinogenic or this. No, we can get product it. placement here. Tab. <laughs> So I think they don't mind, they dump it in Mississippi, right? They don't mind sending it to Mississippi, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what harm going to do there? That's, you right. Know? that's right. Well, i got to tell my Douglas Adams anecdote. This is really about Greg Isles, but I do have to, I was at a, a big publishing event, the, B, the ABA, back when it was the ABA, the American Booksellers Association, and um, they had this big breakfast for all their authors, and I was one of their authors, and Douglas Adams was one of their authors. And, he, and the big book was his next book. And they had a giant picture, a cover of the picture of the cover. When you came in, there was Douglas Adams. Next, and there's Douglas Adams standing there. And one by one, every single editor and bookseller all came up. Douglas, can't wait for the new book. Real excited about the new book. Really excited. And so finally, we had, Douglas and I had like 30 seconds alone. I go, so, so what's, about, what's the deal with the new book? And he goes, I haven't started writing it yet. <laughs> They had a cover, and they had, anyway. Wait, before he goes on, i got to yeah. say one thing about Douglas Adams, because this is how, I, before I was in the remainders, I saw the remainders. I'm not even going to address that the first time I saw him. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're looking for, when you do something as crazy as this book that's outside the box, you don't know if it's going to sell. You don't even know if it's any good. You're looking for affirmation of some kind that wasn't paid for. So, you, here I go, I, I click Twitter couple weeks ago, which I barely know how to use, but I click the app button and it tells you if somebody's talking about your book. And there is Ken Follett, okay? Oh, geez. Ken Follett is on there, who I read when I was in college and, you know, Eye of the Needle and all that. And it says, at Ken Follett, it says, Greg Isles and Natchez Burning, best thriller in years. Okay, now wait, wait, wait. You know, not the best last week, like this, this year. So I turned to my fiance and I said, this, this must be a fake Ken Follett account. <laughs> I didn't believe it, but what I remember Ken Follett most for was right. playing an acoustic set with Douglas Adams I'm and right. the remainder. <laughs> Ken Follett is a great guy, married to a beautiful woman who was a member of Parliament, and writes nothing but great bestsellers. He believes that he has the blues. <laughs> Somehow he got that disease. Some white guys get it. You know, I had it briefly in, when I was in college in the 60s, and we thought we had our mojo working. We didn't, we didn't know what a mojo was, but we had ours working. But anyway. I'm going to endorse Ken Follett at, from Mississippi. I, I'm going to endorse him as a legitimate blues man since he helped me so much. So I want to talk about your accident um, a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, was it 2011, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, he almost got killed. He got, as he said, he got hit by a car. He promised us in the band when he was able to talk that he would have a guitar tuner put in his yeah, I, prosthetic <laughs> device, which he didn't do. So don't take everything he says. But how'd that, <laughs> how'd that affect your? Before I answer that, I got to tell you, coming up here with Dave, uh, it's just the funniest feeling because he could make Gregory Peck look like a fool, much less me. Okay? <laughs> So you, you got to be careful. Um, as far as the, uh, I'll, I'll skip something. As far as the accident, it's just um, like Steve. You're going along, you're on autopilot, like we all are. One day you're 40 years old, you do the same thing every day. You wake up and you're 55 years old and you don't know where it all went, you know? It's just that, that's how life is. You know, we live in denial of death, all of us. And when that happens, when fate reaches down and rips your aorta open and kind of says, uh-uh, you only got a few more books left, buddy, if any, you know? And at that point, I just, I said, you know what? It's time to take it seriously. My dad had died. It's not that I didn't take it seriously, but I've, all, I've always done something. I've always partly sold out. Now, I would say 
Most writers either sell out and you're just a whore, or you're a hack, or you're literary and you don't sell any books. That's sort of the twin <laughs> pattern, right? What I always tried to do was what my heroes did, like John le Carre, you know, or Scott Turow, who I'm blessed to say is in the band. Because even though Dave has a rule we can't talk about writing, we have to stick to booger jokes and, and such <laughs> on the bus. Sometimes Scott and I and others get in the back or somewhere and we talk about writing. Um, I always admired guys like Scott, who I thought tried the line between literary and commercial fiction. That's the hardest thing to do, and when you find a book like that, it's the most wonderful kind of book to read, because you don't realize that you're learning things, or feeling things, or being asking questions of yourself, you know? So, two good things happened. I'm just going to say them quick, and I'm, I'm not blowing my own horn at all, but I was at the start of this tour, and my free age, my, my editor, the guy who discovered me, texted me a text and he said, whatever you're doing, stop. You've been waiting 20 years to read this review. Click on this link. And so I click and it's the Washington Post and I'm scrolling on my phone, flipping, what is it, what is it? And at the end, the guy said, Natchez Burning obliterates the, li the, the wall between literary and commercial fiction. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm out of the ghetto, you know, finally, finally. So anyway, you go. So, Let's talk a little bit about it. First of all, I'm not kidding. This is an amazing book. If you start reading it, you will not stop reading it. And it's a big, fat book with a lot of words. But you will not want it to end. Um, it's about race. There's a lot in there about race. And uh, starting with the early 60s in Mississippi and moving forward to modern times. Now, you've lived that world. You're, li you're a southern guy. White, you're white. He's a white man. <laughs> Like some of you are so liberal, you probably didn't even notice that. But <laughs> talk about that race and this. All book. right, people ask me, you know, what, what, how much research did you do on this book? You know, and I just laugh because my ancestors fought for the South in the Civil War. All right, I grew up. Which in, side they fought? They fought for them. Both sides. No, yeah. the South. Uh, the, the losing side. Yeah. And um, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. My mother lived on a farm, literally picked cotton until she got out of college. It sounds like Steve Martin in The Jerk, you know, but it's true. I, I, I acted in the Confederate pageant, the most politically incorrect thing in the world, from the age they could pull velvet pants on me as a boy. I dug ditches and loaded trucks with black guys for my summer job. My dad was a doctor who treated probably 60% African-American patients. <laughs> and then I graduated from Ole Miss. So you don't really have to do any research about the South <laughs> after that. You pretty much got it, you know. Um, but a lot of things, ha I saw a lot of things growing up in Mississippi. I saw integration really happen in 69. When I was a kid, the biggest KKK meeting in the entire history of the United States happened one mile from my house. And my dad walked me down the road with a camera. And what I remember is not only the men, women, and children in the robes looking like weird sets of ghosts on Halloween, the horses had the, the hoods. It looked like the Crusades or something. And it was, it was truly scary. And my dad had served in Germany after the war and, and knew a lot about the Holocaust. And he, I was lucky that he, from that early age, sort of showed me the parallels between those things and how bad what was going on, you know? And um, God, that's the short version, so, you, you know. Well, right now, this is like a, a topic of much interest in the United States. Right yeah. now, we have Donald Sterling, the <laughs> owner of a NBA team, talking, I mean, in a way that a lot of people thought nobody talked about anymore. Um, talk about that. Okay. I'll tell you how complicated race is, okay? It, it, you remember when President Obama got elected and people started talking about a post-racial society? Can you imagine how absurd that is? Okay, it'll be at least another generation or two before we're in a post-racial society. One thing this book gets across is the complexity of race, all right? Mississippi has always been the whipping boy for the country on race, all right? But if you think racism is unique to Mississippi, you're crazy. All right. In 1964, when the Neshoba County workers went missing, one of the biggest manhunts in history happened in Mississippi. That's why they opened an FBI office there. The Navy, the National Guard, everybody was hunting those civil rights workers, two of whom were white college kids from the north. During that hunt, two 19-year-old black kids were, f were found 
drowned, murdered in the offshoot of the Mississippi River, beaten to death and drowned alive. For a few hours of hysteria, there was messages racing from Mississippi to Washington while they thought it might be the missing kids. As soon as they found out it was two black kids, black kids in Mississippi, spotlight moved back over here. Everybody forgot it. It wasn't solved until 40 years later because of the family of one of the victims. Now, what does that say? It says that apathy is universal, okay? If it's two white kids who go missing, oh, let's call out the Marines. Two black kids in Mississippi, eh, that's what happens to black kids yeah. in Mississippi, okay? Now, one, one thing, though, about complexity. I was in Tupelo, Mississippi, home of Elvis. I, I, I hesitate to even tell this story on a live stream, but I'm going to do it because I always get myself in trouble and what the hell. <laughs> These very nice African-American ladies are in line. They look 60-ish, older. One of them's young. And people are, you know, they have to write on the post-it what they want me to write. And it might say, warm regards. It might say, to the best weekend I ever had, whatever. I'm easy. <laughs> I don't care. So the, the, the black ladies get up to the line, and the, the paper says, to my biggest colored fans. <laughs> And I, so I look up and I say, they're smiling. I said, you know, it's 2014. I'm not sure I can write to my biggest colored fans. You know, it's going to be on the inter Internet five minutes later, and I'm going to be the next Donald Sterling, right? But, you know, I didn't know what to do. And then one lady with them leans down to me and says, you know, my sister lived in Mississippi in the 1960s, and she broke her leg when she was a child. And your daddy was the only doctor that would come out to our wow. house and set her leg. I wrote to my biggest <laughs> color fans, <laughs> bigger than that. I mean, that's how complicated race is in the United States. I got to read you, just apropos of what Jeff would, I mean, Greg was just saying. It's my brother, Jeff. Jeff is his brother. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beginning of chapter two. It's a quote. If they'd, have just, if, <clears throat> if they'd have left them two Jews alone and just shot the nigger, said Frank Knox, none of this would be, even be happening. New Yorkers don't give no more of a damn than we do about one less nigger in the world, but you kill a couple of Jew boys, and they're ready to call out the Marines. Yep. Uh, you know, this book is brutally frank. It's brutally honest. And what I say is I write about the world the way it is, not the way it ought to be. Okay? If you want sugar coating, don't read my book, okay? If you want, if you're just reading to find out who done it, don't read my books because I don't write who done it. Agatha Christie did that better than I'll ever do it, however many years ago. And second, that's almost an eighth grade exercise, okay? I write why done it. I want it, all my books, whether about the Holocaust or this, or repressed memories of child abuse or artificial intelligence, are they're an inquiry into the nature of evil. Why do good people do bad things? Are there any people who are completely evil? Okay, that's what I'm interested in. And the rest, you know, and, and it's a miracle to me, honestly, that an 800-page doorstop about some of the most unpleasant things in the world could be sitting at number two on the New York Times list. It, it may drop like a stone. At least we got it up there. Now, we've been serious for too long, so I got to put Dave off balance before he gets too comfortable and <laughs> remembers he can start jabbing me here. So I brought him a present. You have right notice. You can see he's nervous. He, he's not going to expect this, so here, just oh, easy open, Dave. No big deal. Don't, not, don't get your expectations too high. My, my Remember, own. a Lannister always pays his debt. <laughs> Hey, you, you went to a lot of trouble here. <laughs> it's screwdrivers. Because <laughs> he took mine. <laughs> he borrowed my... Yeah, thank you. I don't know that they all need to know this, but he just... Tell he, he took my screwdrivers. At the last... At the Miami Book Fair, in the, in the hectic chaos prior to the last Remainders gig, I, I needed to adjust something on my guitar. I didn't have a screwdriver. I asked Dave if he had one in the house. I had a whole set. He goes, I, and I'm trying to fit it, and he goes, he wanted everybody to go. He goes, oh, just take them all. Take them all. So I take their household, their whole kit there. So I've lugged this around on my whole tour. Our, so house, I could, our whole house is broken now because... <laughs> 
but now I can fix it again. Yeah, you know what I think of with him with screwdrivers? When we played the, what is it, the EMP in Seattle? Yes. Where is that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Who, who, who designed the EMP in Seattle? Some famous. IMP or somebody? IMP. Yeah. Somebody else. Have you ever seen that place? We, put, we get up to it, and Dave walks up. It's made out of the, you know, whatever you call it. It's the ugliest building you've ever seen. Sort of Buckminster Fullery thing, and Dave starts knocking on it. And he goes, you know, I think with a couple of Phillips head screwdrivers, we could take this damn thing apart. <laughs> I'm telling you, I got, I'm going to say some good things about him when he can't stop me and we're on camera. The funniest thing I ever saw was we're playing Google headquarters, and they're showing us all the highest tech stuff, and it really looks like it does on that movie, The Internship. We're just walking around like goggle-eyed kids. And Dave walks in a room where there's two guys, obviously engineers. They're staring at this board filled with equations. I don't even know what the symbols mean. It's so complicated. <laughs> Dave walks up behind him. He stands there. He stands there five, ten minutes like he knows what's going on. And they're very, you know, sweating. They're working something. Finally, Dave goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> Dave says, this is all wrong. <laughs> and they, they turn around. Just, ha, huh, their eyes are this big. And Dave goes, this is all the wrong color. <laughs> now, wait, that's not the last good. Here's the good thing. I'm, I'm gonna, he gave the intro, so I'm going to say one more thing. I, I want you guys to understand, everywhere I go, I can't tell you how much publicity I've gotten from the rock bottom remainder. It wouldn't, it wouldn't matter if I was number one for 68 weeks. What people want to know is what Stephen King is really like or what, what he's really like. But this guy, I, I kid you not, is the rock bottom remainders. And I'll, I'll tell you why. We have played shows without Stephen King. We have played without Amy. We've played without Scott. They played without me. Played without Roy Blunt. Played without Matt Groening. Anybody. Now, we haven't played without Ridley. Ridley Pearson's the best singer in the band, no doubt. But I could probably play Ridley's bass part. But we were once offered the chance to to warm up Bob Dylan and Nora Jones at a party. And we had to say no because this guy and Mitch Album were playing some other gig, like in Ireland or somewhere, and they wouldn't. We were all like, cancel it. You know, we want this gig. And they wouldn't. But the point is, the remainders can play without Steve and without most of us. But we cannot play. They offered us. You know, Dave said, hey, you guys play. We cannot play without Dave Barry because Without Dave, we would look like guys who actually believed we were worth a crap. <laughs> but but he, is, he is a liar. Dave is a very good guitar player, okay? He, he is the best at pushing... He is so drunk, at, I, think. <laughs> I think. He is the best at pushing expectations to the floor. So by the time, by the time we come out, anything would go over and whip him into a frenzy. So... I had to say that while we were on the record. Well, I'm going to ask one last question, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, there, what about every book you write seems to get movie interest? How about this one? Okay, this is crazy stuff with this, this book on movies. Now, I'll say this. Some of my books have gotten a lot of movie interest. Others, not so much. And usually, it's the Mississippi books that don't get the interest. They're too complicated, they're too long, they're too internalized. Hollywood wants nice, linear, short capsules, you know, that you'll forget a week after you buy the ticket. All right, but this book, it's gone crazy. The phone is ringing off the hook, and I'll tell you why. The culture we are living in has changed, all right? In the, in the 90s and 2000s, the sort of mainstream thriller was in the John Grisham, young idealistic attorney, basically stretching the limit of PG, you sort of knew what was going to happen, all right? But sometime after 2008, when we all got slapped in the face and lost 20 to 40 percent of our money, people got more serious. And now, the center of gravity of the culture, as far as drama, has shifted over to True Detective with Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson and Game of Thrones and that stuff. And that's where I always was. So when, when the Grisham paradigm was central. I was marginalized, really, because I was too dark and too violent. But now that the culture has shifted, they're like, oh, my God, this is the next one. Here it is. Louisiana, Mississippi, rednecks. Let's do it. You know? <laughs> so, but it's so crazy. I'm getting calls 
there are major actors ready to like fly out and meet me on the road. Name some names. No, I won't drop names. <laughs> Is one of them Charlize Theron? No, well, I... <laughs> That's another whole story. I've met Charlize Theron. I'm looking over at his fiance, Carolyn, the beautiful Carolyn over there. Um, but, you know, it's fun for a change to have Hollywood come to you. You know, the story I tell is uh, something Gr Grisham told me, gave me advice way back, and I hadn't followed his, his advice ever. First, it, first it, <laughs> Always a wise that's idea. That's how stupid I Nor am. Nor have I, you know. And then. John said, Gre in 94, he said, uh, I think it was 94, he said, Greg, write a book, one book every year and write the first page of your next book the day you write the last page of the previous book. Had I done that, I would be far richer and more successful. But the second advice he gave me was, when you start talking to Hollywood, drive to the California border, extend your book with your right hand very slowly, snatch the check with your left hand, and haul ass back to Mississippi. <laughs> and never think about it again, because it will only cause you pain. I haven't taken that advice either, but, you know, we're going to one step at a time. That's very good advice with the movie industry. Anyway, um, here he is. Ask him anything. The guy's... Here he genius. is. I'll make him tell the truth. Well, I was wondering how uh, this instant communication now is going to change our society in the next 50 years. How do you see it coming? Yeah, how is that going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you have the internet in Mississippi? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, we're still working on flush toilets. No, I'm, um, I, I'm not qualified to answer that, but I'll tell you one of the most profound changes to me is that kids no longer know how to talk, and second, they almost don't These know how to think. These kids today! I know. They almost don't know how to think, and I'll tell you why. For example, when I would go home to Natchez from Ole Miss, five-hour drive, okay, six, five, six hours, when you took a drive like that or in the north, wherever you were, and you were 19 or 20, you were completely alone with your thoughts. You had nothing to do but think. You learned what contemplative actually meant. You questioned your existence, what was happening, whatever. When my kids ride back from college, they're not alone with their thoughts for 10 consecutive seconds. Yeah. Okay? And I think that will profoundly, to the point of affecting neural pathways, change how people are. Now, shut up before I get too far off that. Good. Good sense of humor, right? <laughs> I hope. Don't throw this back at me. <laughs> okay, Steve Berry. Don't ever get Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that meant. <laughs> I agree. And as far as he's concerned, you stole my thunder there because I was going to congratulate him for being number two on the New York Times best seller list. Thank you. And taking the place of uh, JP, I'm sick of seeing him three times on that list. We won't mention any names. He's in my song, uh, Big Best Seller Blues. Yeah, yeah. I'll say that. <laughs> I wish we what? could get him to sing that song. <laughs> what, what I want to know is, is your book trying to, the book that you write about your, the geographical area you live in, yeah. are you, those emotions, are they your sentiments? Are you trying to say something? politically to us, or are you just writing what you think that the public wants? Oh, no. I, okay, what am I trying to say? I would say this. I live in a place where in the public school system, one out of two kids does not graduate. The school's 99% black, okay? Now, lest you think that's unique, I was out in Seattle talking to a guy in L.A. who deals with school system. There, one out of five kids doesn't graduate, okay? That's a lot better than one out of two. But he told me there about how economically you wind up with a Latino school, black school, white school, whatever, universal. What I'll say about the South is this. You know, we got a long way to go, but the country's got a long way to go. You know, when I'm in Mississippi, I'm the most critical son of a bitch in the state, okay? I try to change it. But when I'm out of Mississippi, it's like my mama. I can say shit about my mama, but you better not. <laughs> Okay, because... Do you have a mold around your house like Stephen King? No, but I'm not sure it's still standing. I'll know when I get back from the tour, okay? Ole Miss, class of 69. All right. <laughs> Willie Morris used to call it poor old down Mississippi. Yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering, you're down there, and I'm in and out. Uh, take the pulse of the place. As high as it now? Well, he mentioned Willie Morris, and he was at Ole Miss in 69. I was actually taught by Willie Morris in 1980 in a little 
he was the writer in residence, or need I say the drinker in residence part of the time. <laughs> Willie wouldn't mind, God rest his soul. He brought down writers like William Styron. I got to watch Deliverance, Squeal Like a Pig, with James Dickey sitting right here <laughs> telling me about it. John Knowles, who wrote a separate piece. So I really got, you know, I had an agent whose theory was great suffering produces great art. Now, there's something to that. Mississippi is still backward, but Donald Sterling. I don't need to say more than that. You know, there are also a lot of enlightened people in Mississippi, okay? And let me tell you three people who came out of that little program I was in at Ole Miss. It wasn't even a program. We just hung out. One was John Grisham, who wrote A Time to Kill and Nobody Bought It. And John decided, well, okay, let's see if they like this. And then he wrote The Firm, and he sold more books than anybody on the planet since then. Also in that program was a little girl named Donna Tart, which you, whom you may have heard of. All right? Donna wrote The Secret History, was paid a mountain of money at the time, took 10 years to write The Little Friend, 12 years, I think, to write the new book, got every sentence right, and wins the Pulitzer Prize. Now, I, you know, I get the You're Your Own Worst Enemy Award, but I, I'm trying. But my point is, if I, I could sit here and name the greatest artist who ever came out of America, okay? Elvis Presley, all right, William Faulkner, Tennessee Williams, okay, Morgan freaking Freeman, okay, <laughs> you, all day long. It isn't that we got some pretty good artists coming out of Mississippi, the best, Leontine Price, an opera, okay, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a place that's still a place. Anywhere in America, I pull off the highway, it all looks the freaking same. It's the same franchises. It's the same stuff. It's the culture's homogenized. In Mississippi, Jack, you cross the border into Mississippi, you know you're somewhere. Okay? And that's all writing is. Writing is having a voice. Writing is not having command of the language. I tell people this all the time, especially attorneys. Okay? <laughs> they all think they're better than Grisham. Okay? Command of the language is just a hammer and nails. That's all. Writing is about the voice, authority, okay? When you write a sentence, when you read a sentence by a real writer, you may not know where they're going, but you know they know where they're going, and you trust them to get you there, all right? And here's, here's my proof. If Dave Barry tells us he can sing, how many seconds of singing will it take us to determine if he can sing or not? <laughs> Four seconds? Five seconds? In my case, no. Why is it with writing... People think, because I can write a letter, or I can write a legal brief, I can write a great novel, okay? It takes just as much of a gift, because the gift is story, okay? Not the words. Sorry to run off. <laughs> you. I was going to wait until you got one He's the leader up here. I'm well, the one straight up. Anymore. We know where that goes. Um, <laughs> About five days ago, she bought me the book before my birthday, and I'm halfway through it. It's awesome. Thank you. I'm at the point, and don't do any spoiler for me, because I know you won't. There's a lot of what's going, or what went on in Katrina in New Orleans, which yeah. comes up in the book. Yeah. And as I'm reading that, there are many, many things that, that I'm going through, and I'm saying, oh my God. You know, and as I'm reading that part, I'm thinking to myself, and maybe I would like your opinion on it, how close did the HBO series from May pick up on what I'm seeing coming out on the pages of this? Well, I'm not qualified to give a full answer to that. I will just say Treme did a good job at what they were doing. I'm exaggerating a bit, okay, for a thriller in the modern part, not the older part. Yeah. But this is what I would say about Katrina. If Katrina had happened in Connecticut, do you still think thousands of people would have died and been stranded on the highway out there after three days? No. Why is that? Well, because it's a bunch of black people down in the south. That's why. And do you think people were happy or sad that Hurricane Katrina cleared out the projects and those people didn't come back? Happy or sad? You know, that's, this is realities, guys. They are unpleasant realities, and I don't know if they'll ever be de dealt with, but that's, that's almost too serious. So. But the double eagle is real? 
The double eagles are based on a real group called the Silver Dollar Group. I, I do feel That's obligated, I should say this. The Klan, I never used the Klan as antagonists in a previous book. You know why? It's bullshit. We're on the internet, I can say bullshit. Okay, by, by the mid to late 60s, the Klan was neutralized by the FBI with money. Okay, Grand Klegels and Wizards and Poobahs, they were sending weekly reports to the FBI for money. It was the South. They were poor white guys, okay? As one guy in the book says, you know, the Klan we got now is about as dangerous as the Garden Club, okay? But there was a group of guys in Concordia Parish, Louisiana, called the Silver Dollar Group, all right? They didn't wear robes. They didn't have meetings. No BS. They just killed people, Okay? <laughs> They, carried, they each carried a silver dollar minted in the year of their birth. That was their only identification. When one died, they would leave it on the coffin. Okay? These guys were never infiltrated. They, none of them even went to jail. One went to jail 40 years after the fact, and some are still alive. And I found out, I mean, I've been in Walmart with these guys. I found out with them because I got to know a guy like Henry Sexton in the book. His name's Stanley Nelson. He's a real guy. He's probably Dave's age. He's been, which is young, you know. But this guy, from a tiny little paper with 5,000 people, subscribers, in, in a cotton field in Faraday, Louisiana, home of Jerry Lee Lewis. That's a claim to fame. Jerry Lee Lewis and Claire Chenault, okay? He, um, he, he started working these cases because he found out that these, they wasn't Medgar Evers. It was just poor, regular black folks going about their business were murdered because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. He did more than the FBI. He had the FBI calling him for information. And this guy met, does not make money. And he made enemies of all his neighbors because you know what he was doing? He was doing the right freaking thing, which is what not many of us do. It takes guts to get spit on in a grocery store, you know, in your own town. James McBride, who's in our band, who just won the National Book Award, I'll plug James. In Natchez, we have the second biggest slave market in the whole United States. It was about to be sold off and just developed over. There's no hardly a mark or anything. And this African-American guy's been crusading to preserve it, but it was about to go away. So I'm a hermit, but I went down to the meeting, and I said, I got to get involved in this. And I knew I needed some weight because I didn't call Dave because he's white. So <laughs> I, called, I called James McBride. And, and James and I, look, he's played sax on a few songs. You know how James is the other really good musician in the Rock Bottom Remainders. But, you know, in the Remainders, some of us are really tight friends. Other guys don't show as, at as many gigs, and you, you only know them as cordially, right? And so I knew James cordially, not best buddies. I emailed James McBride out of the blue, and I say, here's the deal, man. If I don't convince these guys, this thing could go away. This place where the biggest slave market, second biggest in the world, and a 20-second story. During the Civil War, black troops who had been sold through that market were given the order by white officers to tear down that market, and it started getting dark, and the officer said, you can knock off for the day, pick it up in the morning. They worked until dawn. There wasn't a stick standing till the morning, and they talked all night about themselves and their parents being sold through that market, okay? When I told James that, he said, brother, whatever you need, I'm going to call Spike Lee. I'll rally the troops. I'll do it. And let me tell you, the last thing anybody on a board of aldermen in Mississippi wants to hear is, we're going to bring Spike Lee <laughs> and James McBride or whatever. So I guess what I'm saying, you know, that's a long way around of saying that um, the remainders are a good thing, you know. I believe Amy has said, you know, everything we do is for literacy, but we have so much fun, we would kill baby whales. We, we would do this to kill the whales. You know? <laughs> but the remainders have done good things, and, and, you know, I don't even know how we got around to that, but whatever, race and all that. I don't see race. James McBride don't see race. And we're from, hell, I'm 54, you know? So there's hope, you know? We'll take one more. One more question. Yeah. Uh, comment and question. Hispanic, white, 
right, maybe. Uh, but as far as someone like me, born in the United States, you know, with my family going back here, there were, we did a count, and we call ourselves the, the, the Vanillas. And there were like seven of us. But one thing that shocked me completely when it came out of the mouth of a, a, a black woman that, that I was friends with, I heard her call one of the other officers one day a big nigger. You're just a nigger. I said, what did you call her? She said, well, he's, she's a nigger. And I said, oh my God, I, said, I can't believe you said that. I, said, I was brought up, taught, and you don't say that word, to a black person, you don't use that word. Right. I said, that, that has such a horrible connotation for those of us who are white in this day and age. Why would you say it? And she says, well, among us, well, that's no big deal. I said, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. So when you said it was complicated, race all that stuff, that is one of the big lessons I learned in that experience is that, whoa, you know, I, there's so much I didn't get. On all these years, you know, that I have worked uh, with many people who are African American, but never in that concentration. And so I, I learned so much from that experience. But the other thing I want to ask you is, do you have a uh, a regular group of people you employ to do research for you where you don't know about something? Do you do all that yourself? I used to do it all myself. She's asking about research. I'll just give a quick, short answer to this. I used to do it all myself. Then when you get on the hamster wheel of you have a book a year, you can't possibly do it all yourself. There are people who do that. I try to do the important part myself. But here's the real thing. You do a ton of that, and you only use, I would say, 3% of what you learn. And one of the big faults of a beginning writer is they, you want to use everything you learn. You know, don't do that because that's just, uh, I don't know what that is, but it's a terrible mistake, okay? <laughs> um, you know, the story's what matters, you know? Now, I will get, I don't know how many letters I've gotten from people saying, you know, you got that stop sign on Berry Street on the wrong <laughs> corner there. I mean, <clears throat> does it really matter, you know? Yep. So now, all right, you. you now, if you I was going to give a one piece of advice to anybody who's writing a novel, that would be it. It's, a, it's very easy to get lost in stuff that's not the story, and if you do, people don't want to read it. They want to read the story. Anyway, this man is the best storyteller I know. Give it up for Greg no. Isles. <laughs> and I don't. I won't always say this, but. You really need to buy this book. It's an incredible book. Oh, anyway. yeah. and, I, and I usually say this, you've got to buy two. <laughs> In any case, let's, 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 thank, let's thank Dave Barry as well. Dave and Greg. It's a great evening, and we'll be, uh, Greg will be signing his book on the other side of the store. So thank you all for coming. I don't need the Batman. I got the screwdriver.